when I was giving clinics and traveling all over the country for LeBlanc Corporation, um, I would be very, uh, say, careful to listen to the students warm up before, say, a clarinet section really sat down and began to do anything formal. They didn't know I was listening, and I could really learn a lot from the training, about the training that they had gotten and about their native clarinet skills. Well, one of the things I found almost universal is that kids have no idea how the clarinet should sound. And uh, I uh, developed an approach to help teach them what characteristic sound was, what it is, and then I could more readily teach them how to do it. If I just tried to go in and start teaching them how to do it, it would be much more frustrating than if I gave them a little bit of, uh, a, little bit of uh, a preface uh, by teaching them how, uh, about what should be done. So once the clarinet section sat down and everyone was, was relaxed, I would ask them a simple question. I'd say, I'd start by making a statement that we're all here playing the clarinet and we're all making sounds on the clarinet. So uh, I, I want to ask all of you exactly what is characteristic of a clarinet sound? Sometimes the kids wouldn't know what characteristic was. So I'd have to explain what characteristic is, like birds have feathers and frogs hop up and down and some of them do anyway and um, so on and so forth so it's a main feature or set of features that you think of whenever you think of a certain thing well what do you think of when you think of the clarinet sound what's characteristic of it and I would get a lot of blank faces because the students had never even thought about it let alone have the question posed to them so um, one of the things I would try to do is get them to learn to listen by concentrating on shape at that time. I never mentioned color and I never mentioned pitch. Uh, I would play, say, two examples and I would ask them, I'd say, well, if you would please close your eyes and I want you to listen to two examples of clarinet tone. And I want you to, to pretend that they're photographs. Instead of music, they're going to be photographs and you're going to be seeing them with your ears. And I would play uh, two examples, something like this, back to back. Once that was over, I would ask the students, well, which of these two sounds, these uh, two groups of sounds, A or B, is the, it would be the photograph that's most in focus, most sharply delineated, so you can really see the objects, and which one is fuzzy, A or B. And um, I don't think I ever found any disagreement. Every time all the students would say, oh yeah, B or whatever it is, the most focused, they would always agree um, that the centered and focused sound, the very well-defined sound, um, was a particular one of those in the order, whether it be A or B. They could always hear it. There was never any disagreement, like say disagreement about shape or, or I mean, about uh, about pitch or um, uh, or about tone color. So uh, from there, I, I would say, okay, look, you know, I produce two different shapes, two different colors, two different uh, actually pitches, completely two different sounds, um, and you could hear that one was more focused. Did you realize that you can actually see pictures with your ears? When you hear musical sound, you're actually getting a picture of the sound, and you can, you can actually hear the shape just like your eyes can see the outline or the shape of an object. This gets the students to really using their ears in a way that they've always been using them, but they've never really thought about it. From there, I would say, well, you know, you realize that uh, there's something funny because I produced these two different shapes um, and I did it on what? I did it on the same mouthpiece, on the same reed, and on the same clarinet. So I didn't switch equipment to make those two different sounds. So if I didn't switch equipment and made two different sounds, then the change must have been something I was doing, not a change of equipment, right? So if you can figure out what I was doing to make, that, uh, to make that difference, then you can learn to do it yourself. And from there, I would go on to explain to the students exactly what I did with the tongue position and with the air, lifting with the thumb, and all the good tone production habits to get that focused sound. 
the difference between just starting out how to do this and how to do that with your tongue position and air, the difference is, is that the students began doing the how with a much clearer picture in their mind of what they were trying to achieve. And within about 15 or 20 minutes, I would have the whole clarinet section producing a beautifully centered, characteristic clarinet sound just from teaching shape. I think it's incumbent on teachers to try to develop tone concept to help the student develop a good concept of clarinet tone as soon as possible. Um, this, is, this is very, very critical because when the student's away in practicing the clarinet, they have to have some critical judgment Elsewise, they'll just be practicing bad habits. They'll just be practicing um, just the, the inferior uh, voicing and maybe trying to sound like their, their stand partner um, instead of having a really good concept. This means that the student learn to listen to music, listen to good clarinet music, and not only know uh, what a good clarinet tone is, but know why it's a good clarinet tone, that it's consistent, that it's focused, um, and these things are separate from the color itself, which I said, as I said, tends to be a rather subjective thing. Now, the student, uh, the teacher who can't play the clarinet uh, may say, well, I can't do this. But, you know, there are lots of clarinet recordings out there that uh, you can certainly uh, 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 supply to your students, recommend to your students to listen, so that even early on they get a good idea of what clarinet sound should sound like. And with your instructions about the shape of the sound, the consistency in the sound, uh, and so on and so forth, they can begin to develop not only a good concept of what a good clarinet sound is, but they would understand why it's a good sound. So they have, they have the sound in their ear, and they have the understanding in their head that they need to really judge the sound critically, judge their own playing critically, and therefore make a lot more progress when they're practicing by themselves. And this is moving the student toward the goal of being autodidactic, of being self-instructing, of being self-critical, and being able to help use their faculties to improve their own playing through critical judgment. So the sooner this can start, the better. And this is the one thing I find is most neglected among teachers, is that they do not teach their students the tone concept. They teach them how, but they don't teach them what. If you teach them what they should be doing and help give them that good concept, I think you'll find your students will progress a lot faster and they'll understand exactly why they're doing the things you're instructing them to do with embouchure and air a lot more readily and they'll achieve it a lot more quickly. Hey Clara YouTubers, thanks very much for watching our videos and uh, please ask your friends to, to watch too and uh, to subscribe to our videos. Um, we put these up for you, and we're very grateful for your comments, for your responses, and for your questions. So thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time when we're going to be talking about using pitch to uh, help develop characteristic clarinet tone.